And as that's going on, we try and do more and more things all at once. Tom Friedman, who writes occasionally for the New York Times some time ago, wrote uh, an op-ed piece called The Taxi Driver, where he talks about arriving in Paris and getting a cab to go from Charles de Gaulle into to Paris. And he realized, in retrospect, what had happened on that taxi cab ride, that he and the driver had done six things. Uh, the driver had driven, talked on the cell phone, this is in the editorial, watched a movie, <laughs> that's scary. He had listened to his iPod, been a writer, listened to his iPod, and on his laptop worked on a story. The one thing that they didn't do, anybody want to take a guess? Talk to each other. But isn't that the way we handle ourselves so much? It's, it's, it's what uh, Linda Stone, a technologist, I didn't know the rest of the students, a technologist, calls continuous partial attention. Continuous partial attention. Think of Martha in the kitchen, pots and pans, working this, working that, and all the time working her resentment. Mary, does Mary have partial attention? No. Mary's focused on Jesus, listening to his words, being fed by him. And so we come here to this place this day. We come to this place with a table set before us. And we come from all sorts of different places. Y'all don't look like the same family. But you are. As Desmond Tutu has said, you are all related. Because Jesus was serious when he said, God is our Father. Now, now if God's our Father, get it? <laughs> Desmond will say, that means that there are no outsiders. All are insiders. All are connected. All in the language of this moment, this place, this space, all have a place at this table. One of the things I said two weeks ago when I was at St. Andrew, excuse me, St. Anne's in Oceanside, opening of that church after a four-year hiatus, is that this is the welcome table. It is a table where all are welcome, which means we're in the business of pulling up chairs. And, and, and that's what Jesus teaches us and will take the time to be like Mary and be continuously attentive to his word. To be fed by his word and the bread and wine made his body for us and then in us. So we pull up chairs. It's kind of funny who our dinner mates are. And it's remarkable what our table talk will be. And we might come to that table thinking that we are going to simply be satisfied with who we are. But being at the table of Jesus isn't about that. It's about being changed into something different. To be holy and to be Holy Christ means to be one that will be the body in the world. The part of the story we don't get, it's just a mere five verses, is what happens after them. Does Mary and Martha have a moment of reconciliation? Uh, does Mary do the dishes? <laughs> Do Martha and Jesus go on one of those walks where Martha gets her turn? I don't know. I, I, we could write that chapter and probably all our versions would be true. But let's write our version. Because you're going to come and have dinner with Jesus here in a minute. And what's going to happen when we go out? Well, we're going to have a little bit more food, I know. 
but then so let me tell a story which I, I, I pray will give a picture of that and it's, a, it's a story that is apropos because of what's going to happen in this space in just a few minutes as well this is a story of a healer a woman with remarkable healing ability the story comes from Eastern Europe where this woman lived in a village that was divided. It was not a, a division that was ne necessarily noticed very often, but most of the people in the village were, were Catholic, went to church in the, in, in the center of the village at the Catholic church, beautiful church with a cemetery to its side that was walled off of the fence. And this woman was part of a small Protestant sect. But it didn't matter. Everyone knew that she had the spiritual gift of healing. And so when a child was sick, they called her, and she knew just how to make the child well. When someone was hurt at work, she would bind their wounds. Even the Catholic priest, when he became ill in an epidemic, she was the one who nursed him back to life. This happened decade after decade until she herself grew old, fell ill, and then died. The village mourned her terribly. And they went to the parish priest and said, Father, this dear soul mended us all. May we not bury her in our burial ground? And the priest said, Oh no, no, it's not allowed. She's not one of us. Surely, Father, there can be an exception. And just like what Father Day would do, he said, well, I could need to talk, check with the bishop. <laughs> and of course, the bishop said, absolutely not. We have our rules and our regulations. And so, the priest gave the word, no, it may not happen. On the day of her funeral, the villagers gathered together. They took her coffin paraded down into the procession into the center of town and they had dug a grave right beside the fence of the graveyard and they buried this healer right outside the fence of the graveyard they said their prayers and left that night they returned and they moved the fence <laughs> and that goes to what we're supposed to do. There's no fence around the state. And there's a perceived fence we need to move. We need to be Martha and we need to be Mary. But when we do that, whether we're fixing the meal out there or whether we're simply sitting at Jesus' feet and listening, Whichever role, the needful thing is to be continually focused on Jesus, the main thing. To listen and to behave and act as Jesus does. And when we do that, our anxieties, they fall away. Not because every problem is solved, because every problem will be solved through Jesus in the fullness of time in ways that we cannot ask for or imagine. And so, Julian of Norwich had it right. And she said, all things will be well. All manner of things will be well. So, let's get on with the business of continually focusing on Jesus. And what do you say? Let's move some fences. <laughs> Perfect.